and we're live. Over to his Jeffness. All right, so this is Homicide Life on the Street, Season 7, Episode 19, which originally aired May 7th, 1999 on NBC, was written by James Yoshimura and uh, directed by Catherine Bigelow. And I'm going to read a uh, brief plot summary and then turn it over to Ben for his thoughts and then Bradley for his, before I make my comments. Uh, um, so, Mike Giardello and Stu Gardy are ordered to investigate when Emmett Carey, a man who has recently lost both his job and the child custody battle, takes his children hostage on a top-floor apartment of a Baltimore high-rise. Emmett sees Mike on television when news cameras report to the scene and develops an immediate fixation on him. The usual hostage negotiator asks Mike to take over after the otherwise paranoid Emmett shows signs of trusting Mike. Emmett initially mocks Mike's mixed racial heritage, saying that he's never seen a black Italian. But the two eventually develop a rapport as they tell each other about their lives, and Mike repeatedly agrees to Emmett's demands for food. However, Emmett shows signs of paranoia and grows increasingly suspicious as Mike stalls for time to avoid fulfilling Emmett's primary demand a chance to speak to his ex-wife and former boss. Emmett's ex has shown such contempt for Emmett that Mike knows such a conversation would inevitably lead to violence. In fact, when the ex eventually breaks through his security perimeter, Emmett loses his temper and fires his gun wildly. His intention is only to scare her, but he accidentally hits her with a fatal shot. The hostage negotiator encourages Mike to tell Emmett that his ex received only a minor wound as news of her death might further antagonize him. Well, one moment. How, how do they know what his, Mike, his intention was? Mike eventually manages to convince Emmett to release his daughter, but immediately afterward, Emmett kills his son and then himself, leaving Mike devastated that he was unable to save the little boy. Regular characters, Al Giardello, John Munch, Paul Falzone, Renee Shepard, Terry Stivers, and Laura Ballard all do not appear in this episode. Uh, this episode was originally planned for airing on April 30th, but NBC moved it back a week to put more distance between the show's gunman hostage story and the Columbine Massacre. A minor continuity error occurred because of this, but I'm not going to tell you what it was because it's a bit of a spoiler for the episode you haven't seen yet. <laughs> and, Ben, what'd you think? Yeah, I was just saying, how did they know his intention was only to scare his wife? Well, it is an assumption, but from the comments he made afterwards, it didn't sound like he was trying to kill her. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, I thought the acting was good from the guy that played Emmett. And I thought it was also good acting from G Jr. Uh, especially when towards the end, when he's showing that raw emotion. And I thought, like, I think, like, both of those actors that saw this script would have been very happy. Um, and I thought that the episode was in large part carried by the acting. Uh, and then there was things from, uh, good, some good lines from Lewis. That's a hell of a shot. Give the man a medal. And then later on, she accomplished being dead. And then the, the, the bit that made me laugh the most was when Mike Giardello said, you'll give up your gun? And Emmett said, for a pizza. <laughs> um, but just like, I was sort of like related, as I was watching it, I was sort of like thinking that I like the aspects of like his paranoia and you could see how like certain things were getting at the guy like i liked how the f i like the fact that they didn't make him you know like a total bum like they actually said that like he had skills and stuff so like they they put some nuances in that and we saw from his wife that she was a little bit somebody who was like a little bit naggy and like didn't respect him at all. So you could sort of see how all of these things are going to build up in him. Where, and so the character was believable uh, as a hostage. Now, my initial impression was, oh no, not another hostage story. And then it, but after a few minutes, I thought, well, this is probably the best hostage uh story they've done uh and there's been about two or three or three or four or five before this one i'm not sure how many um so i'll, I'll just ask jeff then we can go to bradley but uh, jeff is this the best hostage one you've seen 
Oh, no. I don't think so. A and I can only really think of one other one that was actually a, a hostage situation, and that was the one we actually called hostage that was a two-parter. And I thought that one was better than this one. I think there's quite a bit of action in that one. Yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of another specific hostage one. There's, there was, there was a, a child abduction one, uh, and there was the sniper. Ah, uh, yeah. But I, I don't remember another hostage besides uh, the one, the one guy that uh, took the hostages in the school. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. So, Bradley, what did you think of it? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I, I laughed when you said, "Oh no, that's another hostage episode." Because <laughs> that, that's exactly what I thought. Even even before, I, I mean, you, I could kind of tell it was a hostage episode based on like, the first thirty seconds before, before, before the actual. Um, they actually said um, before they actually introduced the guy and what was going on, and um, before you know the the ominous um, showing. I forgot. Did they show? Did they either show G on TV or they showed G in the camera? But before the ominous shot of the camera has you now, sort of. Um, even before all of that, it was just sort of new. As soon as I saw the people running around and all the people like frantically um, scattering, I was like, okay, <laughs> okay, now, okay, what is this? And then um, I, I sort of figured it was going to be a hostage episode, maybe about a minute in before um, they said, you know, it was a hostage situation. And um, I generally don't like hostage. Um, I generally don't like hostage episodes in any sort of um, format because um, it's uh, it's a lot of, you, you're basically forced to take the situation as it, as it is and you're, you're stuck with like whatever four or five characters that um, are going to be doing only talking, <laughs> purely talking. No, no scene, um, no scene changes. No um, introduction of mo mostly no introduction of other characters. It's just um, sort of one guy in his life confiding to another guy in his life. Which um, you know, and I'm not to say it wasn't well done, but I, I just think I'm pretty um, fed up of hostage episodes in general at this point. And and in 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 any show, like not just um, not it's, just police shows, just sort of the the whole um concept in general. If if I was teaching a writing course, uh, towards the end, I would ask the students to try and write a hostage episode because it would like concentrate on character. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's it's, a, it's just definitely a test of skill. Yeah. To 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 make an episode um that um. To, to make an episode that's compelling enough. Yeah, because also um, because I, it's been because it's been done so many times, it's like a real way to do it well is so hard. Right. I think um, I, I pretty um, I, I generally knew that I already sort of wasn't going to like the episode based on the fact that it was set up to be a hostage episode and. Um, there are some things that are really good, like the, the acting. I currently fault the acting. Yeah. Um, yeah, the acting was um, good. I thought the um, the the hostage taker did a really good job of you know acting, destroy and um, sort of um, conf confiding. Um, it confided in G really well. Did the I thought he acted really well when he um. Was was trying to. He was very cognizant of how he was trying to be outsmarted, and yeah. um, while um, you know, the, while the mother was calling him, you know, stupid and dumb and no good and all that, you know, he still had the good enough head and no shoulders. He was just really, really stressed out. Um, that might be a thing where, in case people know about typology, like, like an enneagram type six, who's maybe like insecure about maybe being average intelligence. And so for that, and like people thinking he's dumb, and it's like he works that extra little bit harder to like suss people out. And because they did say even in the description that he was paranoid, and there were little elements of where if it's just like the little thing that could be misinterpreted, he would misinterpret it, it in a negative way. So um, I did like that exchange with the cop talking about compensation for the for being shot in the foot mm -hmm. 
and I, so I thought that was nice and real. And just by the way they wrote that guy, I wonder, you wonder if he might have been a guy from real life. Um, so I, I like that little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, like I said, the acting carried it. Yeah, I, I think it was, it was mostly the acting, but um, like I really didn't like the part um, how um, how the wife got away twice. Yeah, I thought that that was a bit ridiculous. Like I, I knew they had to obviously further the story, but um, that that um, that short of, it, it is too much. I think it shattered the illusion too heavily um, that she would be able to. Um, yeah, basically, it'd be able to, you know, that they keeping all of this um, effort to maintain the perimeter, and all of a sudden she just gets through it twice. What What's good um, about homicide, though, is when there is a plot hole, they don't try and a potential plot hole. They don't try and hide it. They actually have the characters comment on it. Uh, like, oh yeah, damn, that oh. was a lucky shot. Damn, why did how did you let her through? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, at least it was a top, but but even so, because it like. <laughs> it's, uh, what I like about that is it respects the audience's intelligence for noticing the little, the little bit of the whole, and it, so it at least acknowledges it. Yeah, but really, that that's extremely optimistic thinking. Yes, I, I, I think um, <laughs> because um, because hostage um, hostage episodes, are, um, you, you know, the whole the whole concept of um, ransoms and hostages because it's so rare for it to happen in actual life. The, uh, it, it, it can't really be portrayed as realistic because, um, well, well, it's how to, the standard of what a realistic hostage situation would right. look like is sort of um, up in the air. So you do have to nuance it quite a bit. Right. And, um, but, but because of the, um, because homicide is really good at making the show realistic and because, um, Hostage um, shows are generally inherently like um, they, they need to take some liberties with um, real, you know, with it being a realistic situation to get the story to work. So um, I was basically already sensitive to the fact that um, it was basically going to be about two guys talking, and you, you, you basically had to they had to hold your attention well enough to get keep your interest regardless of you know, how realistic it is or not and sort of the fact that homicide is generally really good about being li realistic and the fact that um you know stuff has to go really really um stuff has to sort of make no sense for it to follow the story like you know her being able to break through the thing a few times um i, I think it was a too much for homicide it, it, it basically it sort of ruined the integrity of um it, it, it sort of oh, I, i've mentioned this a few times now but sort of you know homicide is really good at a few things and whenever they take do these sort of um more fictional like hostage situations or you know the online um the online murders whenever they do that it highlights the well, well it, it, it removes it sort of removes homicide from the the realism and puts it sort of in the realm of the in-between. It puts it more, I mean, it, you can tell it's like not real life, but it, it takes it on the, up basically on the, on the number line of like one to 10 of um, zero being real life and 10 being complete, a work of fiction. Um, mm -hmm. Homicide is normally closer to the realistic side, but whenever they do something like this, it like slowly moves it past the, um, it totally moves it into another realm, which is more fictional, and out of the comfort realm of um, the, the realistic fiction. Right. After that monologue, a <laughs> good monologue, I'll just say <laughs> that um, uh, I empathise better with this guy than the guy in the subway episode. And I think that's just a combination of like a subjective thing uh, in me. And... Uh, I thought I thought it was well acted. Right yeah. then, so over he to said what? I thought what this guy was. About? I thought this guy was uh, acted well, well enough. I didn't miss the word you said though. Was it like you said you related to him more, or? Yeah, I related to this guy. Okay. More better than the guy in Subway. Oh, 
Oh, and also, and also Lewis. Lewis in general just sort of annoys me. <laughs> but, Lewis uh, annoys you. Lewis, yeah, I thought yes, Jeff Lewis and Morgan me. voted him the fair favourite character, I think. Really? Followed by G. I don't know. I mean, he's uh, just like... I mean, I think the acting's fine. It's just a bit like the character who's... Um, wow. That's, yeah, that's sub like that is subjectivity. It just, just shows you how... That's what I like about having different perspectives on this, though, is you get, you know, some, you know, that a different side of the coin, you know, in terms of opinion. You know, yeah, Lewis is my favorite character overall. I, the one I wrote, but uh, overall, I'm most entertained by Lewis. And obviously, he was there for all seven seasons, so has a little bit of a edge and that, you know... Hamilton's not on the show for the final season, so. I think, uh, uh, Bradley, if you saw Lewis in the episode with um, Kellerman, when Kellerman's thinking of committing suicide, and Lewis is talking about his old partner, you might Lewis, like Lewis a bit more, because it shows a different side to Lewis. It's not just Lewis, you know, making jokes, being witty. No, I mean, I think it's a, it's a bit too much. Like, it really, really annoyed me when he's like, ooh, what a shot. <laughs> like, uh, like um, he's, he's definitely, he definitely wears his heart on his sleeve and basically says whatever's on his mind. But um, he lacks tact. Yeah, but, well, he, he sort of does that as a front, though. Because he, like, hides his... I, I mean, I, I, I get the character, I just don't like it. It's not oh, like okay. I don't understand him. It's like I understand him, I don't like it. So, right um, it is purely, it is, it's not, um, yeah, it's not like a lack of understanding or I really hate the, the act of the right. reason. Like, I like, I like the act when I understand the character, it's just, um, I know it's put in front of me and I don't like it. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, but, but, but I, I, can, I can tolerate him, though. It's not like, um, he doesn't enrage me so much. <laughs> but, I, oh, I just don't like him in general. Sorry, go on, Jeff. Yeah, go on, Jeff. What do you think of the episode, Jeff? Oh no, he might have lost connection. See, I can't really tell when it's because it's, the iPad is so quiet. I think you're there, Jeff. Oh no. So, Bradley, just do one of your monologues until Jeff speaks. <laughs> oh, I don't know. What, what, you, what you don't like? You don't like that I'm doing monologues, or? No, no. I mean, I do like. Like I said, it it was. Uh, I, I do like the monologues. It's like, like, like what I said before. It's like what you say is good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, which, which, so it's like I was just thinking uh, about the dynamic. But yeah, uh, so well, I'm, I'm all monologued out. I don't have much else to say. Right, okay. mm -hmm. So what I'll say about, like I said, if you see Lewis in that episode with uh, Kellerman, you see a different uh, side to him. And I mean, you saying there about the comments that Lewis makes, I would say that if you judge him more, by that I mean, standard, it is not because it's as much as the way he says them. Well, what about Munch? Munch makes inappropriate comments. Yeah, but he's Munch. I mean, it's just dark <laughs> humor with Lewis. No, it is. I mean, it's not. It, it's about the way he says it. Because he, I mean, he's he's an SP, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> he, he's like, like, there's, like there's sort of like cockiness. It, it like, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it's it's the cockiness mixed with the um the lack of tact, uh, mixed mixed with the passive aggressiveness. You can get it's a combination of that. You can get that cockiness in ENTPs and in Munch. Yeah, it's I like, mean, he's co he's cocky, but um, he's not passive aggressive. He's, he's more direct. Yeah, this is one of these things which is like, you know, there's not like, like something you can, like, it's like, it's so subjective. Like, yeah. characterization. I, mean, I, I understand it's a fact that I don't yeah. like. It's not. Yes, it's a, it's a subjective <laughs> it's fact. A fact. In your no, head, I, it's I, a fact. I understand it's not a fact. No, it is, <laughs> no it, your feeling towards the character is a fact. I, the, the feeling towards yeah, it. That's it's, a fact. It's not, I don't think he's like a bad character. <laughs> right, yeah. But look, like I said, it's like, 
if someone feels a certain way, I'm not going to say they're lying. It's like the way they feel, that is a fact. Yeah. Because you, you never want to discount people's feelings. You can't say someone's wrong for feeling. It, it, well, it depends. As long as they know their feelings. Yeah. <laughs> if, if they disown those feelings and treat it as facts, as, as now, absolutes, now that, we that's know, when it gets annoying. Now we know they have Twix in the United States. Oh, yeah, they do. They have, yeah. um, they have basically. Did somebody that didn't know that? A, apparently, <laughs> apparently, they didn't. But I'm um, sorry, you can. Um, you I can thought it started in the United thing. States. Maybe I'm it wrong. might have. Um, but you can um, you can talk I'm no glad, Jack because I'm, I'm sort of rambled. You can hear me though because I wasn't sure there for a while. Oh, yeah, you, yeah we couldn't. Was... Yeah, well, for about a few minutes. Past so we five minutes. We put it. So Jeff, over to you for your your monologue. Well, yeah, I guess I, I better get my thoughts on this out before, while I still can. Who knows when I'm going to disappear? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But if you can hear me now, then I'll I'll say a few things. Yeah, good um, to go. First of all, Ben said that it was carried by the acting. Um, I agree with that, but I didn't think it was quite good enough to carry it. Um, there's a, there's something missing, and I started to think, you know, uh, the uh, previous episode that the mo this one's the most reminiscent of is Three Men and Adina from the first season, in terms of that having you know, the limited number of characters, the setting all being pretty much in the same place. Um, but the characters in this one were not as compelling as that one. Uh, and the performance is not, you know, when you talk about Bayless and Pimbleton and Risley Tucker, the Araber, and that you're, you're hanging on every word, you know, that goes between those characters through the whole thing. And there's nothing that seems like filler, nothing that seems like, it, you know, it, it, it's... It just kind of drops. And in this one, there is. And I don't really think it's the fault of Ron Eldard, or Eldard, however you say his name, um, as Emmett uh, entirely. But his his performance doesn't ring as true. And, I, and that's maybe not fair to him because Moses Gunn, who played Risley Tucker, is a really, really good actor um, who just, you know, is captivating in his performance. But that, that was the difference. And, and their choice of using... Mike Giardello is basically the main character from from the main cast. Of the, I also didn't like that decision. I mean, they may have thought at the time uh, they were still trying to build the audience's like respect for that character, maybe. But uh, it's still I would have liked to have seen one of the veteran characters in that position instead of him. Um, you know, the, they do use Lewis and Bayless, but sort of as as almost as comic relief as side characters, which I liked that part. You know, I liked. Um, the Lewis bits were good and then it was a nice change of pace uh, but I would have rather seen the main negotiating person be some one, you know, one of the longer characters um, you know, even with the current cast you, you know they still have people that are, you know they could have had Lewis be the main guy or they could have had Munch or, or, or Bayless have to do it you know something like that it would have been more compelling that way I think than sort of it seems like in the last two seasons they've tried to force feed us the new characters and sort of falsify a rapport with them, and it's really not there uh. and, and to me. So, um, oh. honestly, <laughs> the best that I think Mike Giordello is actually comes later, but, um, but it's really like that, that, you know, I like some of the stuff, you know, the, um, uh, the dude talking about the black Italian stuff, calling Gardy Irish and you know, the Chitlin Scalapini. You know, there were some good lines. Um, uh, and I liked, um, I did like the ex-wife. I thought she was well done uh, for her brief appearance. Um, this was actually the, I think the smallest regular cast they ever had because they only had four of the regular cast in it. Even Three Men and Adina, they showed the rest of the squad a little bit, uh, even though they didn't have much to do with it, but um, uh, as Morgan and I were watching, we said uh, it was funny that it was like a negotiation where he he held he didn't eat the McDonald's he held out for the pizza so he upgraded his uh, his deal on the food uh, <laughs> and um, the realism factor that that's you know there's some good things like um, the details of actually having McDonald's and Coke and Twix you know real products as opposed to kind of the fake TV products you sometimes see that sort of 
you know, take you out of the realism. So that part's good. Um, and the haphazard nature of the way things work uh, is good. The way Homicide does it, where it's not the typical show where everything seems to go uh, in this kind of uniform way where everything either works out or doesn't work out. It's kind of black and white, and it's, and it's you know, much more formulaic. The way this worked was because it was you didn't really know what was going to happen next and didn't know who was going to do what, and there was a little bit more... Um, the unpredictability of it is what is the, the best thing going for it. Um, but I do think it's probably unrealistic that the team, the, you know, the QRT would have turned over negotiations to Mike. You know, he's an FBI agent. It's already unrealistic that he's coming to the scene in the first place. And then second, that he would be the main, the point man on the whole thing. Uh, the, the, the reality, I don't think they trust him in that situation to do that. Um, and, but it shows from him doing that, that he may be somewhat empathetic in terms of, or empathic, however you say that, you know, but in his dealings with Emmett, but he's still not a very good negotiator. I mean, every opportunity he had um, to actually enforce a negotiation, you know, the gun for the pizza thing, everything, he just kept giving up things and never getting the gun. Right. And so he's he's timid, he's hesitant, he's not the guy to have in this situation. So it was, it, you know, this is the kind of thing where I think if it did happen this way in real life, you would have seen heads roll in terms of, you know, a kid gets shot in the situation, somebody would have got fired over this. At least one person, maybe more. Uh, this isn't the kind of thing that once the media, you know, once the publicity got out what happened, there would be some major damage control being done. And you don't see that not only in this episode, but there's no future follow-up to it. Of what ah, the ramifications are. That would have been. And that's the, yeah. That, uh, so, as a so it's not even mentioned. Episode, or, what's that? It, it's not even referenced or mentioned ever again. Well, I, I can't say that for sure. I don't remember for sure if there's any mention. Oh, but um, right. but it certainly is not. You know, th this is the kind of thing that you would think would be a major uh, event. And as it is, it's mainly just a standalone episode, which is why they moved it because they didn't feel like there was anything in it that, you know, would be out of place in a, in the, in the, you know, they, they say they did it for Columbine. I saw they did it just to put it in May sweeps, but either way, either way, the reason they did it, it affect the, the remaining three episodes. So, um, you know, it's out of production order because this one was actually the second to last one in the production order. Um, I'm anyway, um, Right. Um, just toned my my interjection. Like, I think that they would have liked to have used Lewis, but they had that similar situation where Lewis and Kellerman, where Lewis was trying to get the gun off Kellerman uh, when Kellerman was on his boat. Um, yeah, honestly, I think it might have even been better if Munch had to do it. Yes, he, I mean, who, challenge him. Because you think about who's the least likely to be... Yeah, uh, somebody who's seen as like a caring negotiator ah. would probably be Munch. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think <laughs> it, would, it would be believable that if, say, Munch said something funny, that the guy might say, "Hey, I want that funny guy. He's funny," and yeah. then he could like play off that. Yeah, because he might have respected him. Like, if Munch had kind of wised off to the camera, you know, when he was watching the TV, you know, thought, "Okay, this guy is going to shoot straight." You know, I want to talk. To that guy, not somebody who's going to BS me the whole time. Yeah, and he could say that that previous guy was so boring, so predictable. I've had enough of that. Always asking the same thing. So we're, we know when I heard the the gunshot right at the end. My initial thought was, oh, he might have been snipered by the QRT team, and so it was a surprise. Yeah, but, and I think that that's the, that's the effective thing about doing it that way is one thing they probably you know from a network sensor point of view we're not gonna, uh, we're probably not allowed to show someone shooting the kid on camera anyway, but it works effectively because when you initially hear the shots you're not sure who's shooting who so there's that split yeah. second or a few seconds where you know you have to there's the suspense of what exactly happened. Also, from a, like a safety point of view, they probably wouldn't allow it by. Because you've got someone underage is acting that might have to put the thing with their squib exploding and stuff. So dangerous yeah, from a practical whereas, point of view. Whereas the way they did it, they they can take their time and set up the shot of the kid lying on the floor with the candy bar and the blood. So you know. Um. um 
going it back wouldn't even to, have to be the same kid necessarily because they don't ever show his face. So going back to Frank in Three Men and the Dino, there was that nice little thing where that guy was a match for Frank and he brought up this stuff about uh, Frank and the way he talks and him being from a different part um, and him being from uh, New York. And there was a light... Because I usually like it when there's someone who can stand up to Frank and then it's a, a battle of equals. So... That was a really yeah, good Yeah, and, and this might have been sort of equals, but they were equally timid. You didn't have either one as a very strong character, which, you know, I'm not saying that ne that never happens. Obviously, I'm, it probably does. Uh, I've certainly encountered some timid EMT people, even if I didn't encounter timid FBI agents. Um, but so, uh, you know, that's certainly something that can happen, but I, it's not as compelling as having two stronger characters or even three stronger characters. Because even though, though Bayless was kind of, uh, in some ways, the timid one back in season one, he still, that was sort of like the episode. He grows up in a way in terms of his ability to, um, uh, you know, try to get a confession out of a suspect. So what I would do, if I was in charge of this, I would take your idea, Jeff, of it being Munch, and I would, like, still have the same ending, and then we then would have a follow-up episode and how Munch would cope with that, and maybe it would help to develop the character and, like, actually get some more yeah, feelings into it. There's a number of ways they could have gone with this that would have improved the episode, like within it as well as like, probably it does affect my opinion of this, knowing that there's no real ramifications from it. Because, like I said, this is the kind of thing, and it's, they've even focused on in many episodes previously on the way that the bosses and the media and everything reacts to things in terms of trying to politically manage things and that kind of stuff. And you don't. You know, I did like the fact it ended as abruptly as it did. I liked that there wasn't some long, drawn-out scene about it. That part was good, but I think they should have followed up on it, and there should have been, you know, uh, some major collateral damage from something like that occurring. Well, one thing I could say about it is there was a lot more repetition in the conversation than there was in Three Men and Adina, just going off. A vague memory yeah, of that. you know, and that might have been part of what they were trying to do, because, you know, I know that even though David Simon wasn't credited as one of the writers, he always tried to make the dialogue more realistic in that having people say more things that weren't, uh, you know, necessarily relevant to the plot, things that people just say that are just kind of normal conversation. Uh, so they may have been trying to make it um, more, you know, some the way people really talk and that there's some things that aren't really significant in any way yeah but it does but it was like i said it's just not as compelling it's not as interesting yeah. you're kind of you know there's a lot of waiting for something to happen um but even that they've handled better i think um you know not as intense a situation but in the stakeout episode for instance when they had all of the uh when they kept changing you know the people in the house over the 24-hour period or whatever and you got those kind of little insights into the characters so not a lot was ha there was almost nothing happening action wise it was just dialogue, but that to me was more compelling because they kept it, the variety up as it went. And so even though you're kind of sitting around waiting for something to happen, you never really felt like, well, this is boring because nothing's happening. It was more like, you know, you're experiencing what the cops are experiencing, having to sit around waiting all this time, but they're talking the whole time, so you're getting that interplay. And in this one, the interplay just wasn't as interesting. And, you know, the kids were cute. Um, but it wasn't enough to carry it. No. Um, I would think that, I wonder if the experience of the audience might be different if they're watching it with the adverts in, and it would, like the adverts might break up the repetition a little bit, and where you've not got the variation within the actual show, but with the adverts, I don't know if that would change the viewing experience. <laughs> For me, it would probably make it worse, because, you know, if I was watching it, you know, and sitting through commercials as opposed to like fast forwarding through them or anything, you know, because you're probably going to be seeing, you know, some probably saw a McDonald's commercial in there somewhere <laughs> or Coke <laughs> or Twix. <laughs> yeah. McDonald's might not be happy because, you know, they don't want to be associated with the nasty. So you said something, was it now I'll probably butcher in this. Did you say something like chitling scallopini? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, the, the, the dude's making, he was making a, a comment about the fact that he was mixed black and Italian. Yeah. So he's saying chitlins, 
you know, it's just you know, like a soul food dish. So that's the black side, and then some jalapenos, yeah. Italian. So you ah. just combine them two, making trying to make a racial joke, <laughs> which um, Mike rolls his eyes at, and that's when he asks him, like, "Who are you looking at?" And he's like, "I was just looking away <laughs> because of what you said." Oh, uh, oh, I think I didn't interpret it as an eye roll. I just thought he was like looking at that. It, it looked like it to me. Ah. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm. I wasn't paying close enough attention. Kind of like, oh, this, you know, on top of whatever this else this guy is, he's probably a racist too. So, <laughs> it's kind yeah, of I mean, that's at. pretty mild. That's just well, yeah, banter. Yeah. I mean, that's just really banter. I mean, like he's Irish. He refers to himself as an Irish American, and he calls yeah. God Garty uh, uh, Irish. Yeah. So he, every other time he talks to him, he calls him Irish. He doesn't call him by his name. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so I mean, even we, we don't use his first name. We don't call him Stuart. Um, and I used to call, what about that NF guy? That short little NF guy? Again, I, I still refer to him as the short little NF. And then I can't remember his name. And then Jeff tells me. You're talking about Brody. Yes, Brody. <laughs> it's not that hard a name to remember. I think you just like calling him the short little NF guy. I just never, I it's like tradition now. He's like an ENF. What do you think? What do you think his type? Was yeah. Let's not, let's right. not get off on that. He wasn't even in this episode, Ben. Okay, NF. <laughs> Short little NF. If, if dude. You, you can you can tell people if they want, they can check out the other videos from season four, especially I guess four and five were the seasons where Brody was around. So you can yeah. go check out those episodes because we yeah. talked about his type yeah. back then. Go 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 watch all of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, after you've watched all the those, type of those videos, all right? And those um, amazingly compelling discussions about Brody's type. Right, so given what we've said there, Bradley, has anything like popped up at you? Um, I mean, not really. I pretty much said all I need to, want to. But I, I might have been. I, I think I must have gotten triggered when um when the girl runs out and all those guns are pointing at her. <laughs> yeah, that was well done. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was well staged all around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got tried to get some. Oh, yeah, I mean that, that that produced an emotional reaction from me, so I guess that's good. That's good television. Yeah, and the, and the very end did to me too. Um, so I can't, you know, I can't fall for that. They got the desired result in terms of, you know, obviously since I'd seen it before, watching this again, I knew what happened, but it still got me again in terms of, you know. <laughs> the helplessness feeling, you know, where he turns around for a split second and he, you know, not right. only shoots himself, but the kid as well. Um, mm-hmm. Those, 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 I mean, the, the, uh, the little boy and the little girl, they're going to be like in their late twenties now. So it gives you an idea of how time passes on and how old the show is. And yeah, the, it's not, re- yeah, it's not really aged, uh, that much. Uh, so I give this one about eight out of ten because because I was thinking, well, how could they have made this better? And it's like I was sort of like judging it for what it was. And maybe I was in like a generous mood or something. So yeah, I think. But yeah, I think if they had used Munch and like because it's like taking Munch out of his comfort zone of being like the wisecracking guy then and actually like putting him in a situation where he has to deal with something emotional that would have been uh, a good challenge for him because i've not really used munch that well in the series we think he's been underused uh so i'll give it about eight out of ten no um i'll give it seven out of ten um Not really much more to say, just that I generally don't like hostage episodes in, in any format. So I already was sort of not enjoying it. Yeah. The, the, the acting was done well enough. The story progressed. Um, I, the story progression was pretty comfortable. Um, I, I think the, the choices the choices that um, D had to make, you know, he's basically acting on his own authority. Did that, did that say Coca Cola? It yeah, it's Coca Cola. Maybe they changed it a little bit. I'm not <laughs> sure. I, I, what was weird is I was able to empathise both with Junior G, 
and with the guy, the hostage taker. So it was quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I admired um, G's um, ability to sort of um, take charge and, you know, go with what he wanted to. So it's also like, in, you know, his inner convictions, him, him blocking the the sniper, the not the sniper, the, um, you know, the, the gunman sort of stood in his way, didn't allow him to take the shot. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to try and save this guy. And of course, you know, he couldn't save him or the, or the kids. So. I mean, like Jeff was saying there that he needed to be a bit more of a tough yeah, I, yeah. I mean, but it, it, I, that's I would, definitely <laughs> the takeaway. But I would but say, I, I his ability to take a risk. But I would say though that with this guy who's like shown that he reacts in a certain way to like, I mean, it's not like with an enneagram type six. If you try and be pushy with them, they can react in a way that you don't necessarily like because they they sort of snap, and you know is that he's a sort of snappy type of character, as in. If you say anything that's slightly off, he reacts in an aggressive way. So, over to Jeff. All speculation. Uh, I'll also give it a seven. Uh, agree with it. Uh, it was good, but it could have been much better if there are certain things they would have changed about it that I've already mentioned, like the choice of the characters and uh, some of those things. But So... Um, and, and, and if I'd been in charge, somebody would have been fired over this <laughs> for Definitely. letting Mike Giordello be the uh, uh, FBI liaison to the homicide unit, be a hostage negotiator with kids involved. That was a bad mistake. Yeah. yeah. Or, or maybe just asking him to get involved in to begin with. Right. Well, that, that's <laughs> he, he's asking probably, for you, so I'm going to give it to him. Probably yeah. the one who should be fired was the guy that, you know, was apparently the chief negotiator assigned to this that just turned it over to him. Uh, that guy yeah. would have been out of there, or at least reassigned to a different position. This is not a guy we want to trust to make no. decisions <laughs> in this situation again. Well, so. I, I suppose it's combination. So, for instance, you know how in boxing they'd say different styles make different fights and certain boxers aren't, aren't a good style up against other boxers because it's like clash of styles. And it might just be that for this particular guy, you don't want a negotiator that's very in charge and stuff and aggressive. Well, yeah, it, it, it's you another one of those things where it's easy for me to say after the fact. And, you know, the, you hear, hear, you know, guys in sports talk about all the time that, you know, if a coach makes a crazy decision or calls a play that fails and everybody blames the coach, oh, why did you call that play? You know, you know, a few years ago in the Super Bowl, uh, ben and I, I think talked about this before when uh, everybody was at the Seahawks just had to run the ball in with the guy that just been running over them. And instead they throw a pass and it gets intercepted and they lose the game. Um, then everybody's on the coach for why didn't he just run the ball? Uh, you know, oh. if, if this situation, everybody gets out alive, then maybe, you know, there's commendations involved, but because they don't, <laughs> it goes the other way because then, then they're, you know, if that had happened, then they're praising the guy's decision-making ability to bring this dude in who could relate to him and all that stuff. So it kind of depends. It's one of those things where, you know, 2020 hindsight, you can say this this decision was wrong or right, depending on the outcome. Who were the Seahawks playing? Was it the uh, Steelers? It was the Patriots, wasn't it? I don't know. Because... Cause... I didn't. Was this? When was that? I didn't watch the latest Super Bowl. No, it wasn't the. It wasn't the last Super. It was like, like three Super Bowls ago. Oh, dear, it's all a blur. <laughs> it's funny. I figured you'd get that reference because I thought you were the one that brought it up before with me. So I was like, uh, um, oh, because yeah. there's been so many things that happened. Like for instance, with when 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 uh, Atlanta Falcons were up. By so much against New England, and they still went on passing the ball when they should have been a bit more defensive. Which is what, and they actually said about Bill Cower that when he was when he was with the when he was coaching the Steelers, the Steelers were the best team at holding on to a lead because they would just like give the ball to Jerome Bettis, yeah. Jerome the bus Bettis. And yeah, twenty fifteen Seahawks lost to the Patriots. All I had to do was look. Up Seahawks lost Super Bowl, and I get a Seattle Times headline: Seahawks lost because of the worst call in Super Bowl history. <laughs> I probably didn't watch it because it was the Patriots. Because 
uh, instead of handing off to Marshawn Lynch, they uh, threw a pass and it got intercepted in the end zone and they lost the game um, oh. from the one yard line. Uh, anyway, so to recap, um, Ben said eight, Bradley seven, and I also gave it a seven. Uh, so join us next week for, in my opinion, the last mediocre episode of Homicide, because uh, we finished with two pretty strong ones. Uh, but next week's is called the Y chromosome. And I'll just let folks know about why Jeff puts the numbers at the end, because he like listens to it, and then we're going to go over all the episodes at the end. So that's eight from me, seven from Bradley, and seven from Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when we do the season recap, it won't take me as long to find the scores. Right. So, <laughs> Bye-bye, folks. Bye-bye, folks. Badly waved.